We're getting ready to uh, begin the procedure, and um, again, the most important thing, one is the team, anesthesia, nurse, and the technician, as well as the physician. And um, the important thing is positioning, positioning, positioning to avoid any potential complications. The number one complication could be aspiration. However, we make sure that the patient is positioned on a 30 degree angle, so we have gravity to help keep the water down towards the stomach and the head is positioned back like this, an extension to facilitate passage of the endoscope and keep the airway maximally open for breathing. And then we provide the patient with some eye protection in case anything were to come out of the endoscope. First part of the procedure is we're going to do an endoscopy so that we can actually inspect the damage that's been done by reflux, document that, and then also establish the length of the esophagus, which is very important in order to be able to measure what we're doing during the procedure. It is also normal to have oxygen on the patient um, as a safety measure. We're going to pass over the tongue. I can just clear this image so I can show you. You see this very co this cobblestoned appearance to the base of the tongue. This is very characteristic of people with LPR type reflux. This uh, lunar type structure, this is the epiglottis, which is trying to protect the airway. We're going to go under that, and this is the larynx, which shows evidence of inflammation, as well as inflammation at the level of the cord. So we know that he has reflux into the larynx. We'll just document that real quick with a picture to be able to show that there's no damage caused by the procedure afterwards. So we're going to go down a little bit further. This is going through the upper esophageal sphincter area, and we're now in the upper esophagus. And as we move down through the esophagus, we'll use a little bit of air to open things up. So as we look at the bottom of the esophagus, it is actually inflamed. We no longer can see the blood vessels. This tells it that, us that there is inflammation. And we're moving down towards the junction between the stomach and the esophagus. And we're going to try and measure this distance, and we have to measure it three times to get three accurate measurements. And that's the first. And we'll do that each of three times because the esophagus does change, it elongates or will shorten. And we want to make sure when we place our catheter, we're always in the same place. Okay. And let's do that one more time. And each time we're just going to keep the air flowing. And this will duplicate what we're going to do with our catheter. So it looks like. 42 will be our distance. And then the other thing I'll point out to you as we look down the esophagus is that this sphincter muscle is very loose, as you can see here. It just stays open by itself. Um, and then this area of tissue here where you can see kind of almost like a little tongue of a different color tissue, this is uh, adenomatous tissue. This is what we call Barrett's tissue. So he has Barrett's esophagus to go along with his reflux. And the good thing about that is that what we've demonstrated is years after having had the strata procedure, this will spontaneously regress. It's caused by reflux, and it will go away once we stop the reflux. Once we enter the stomach, we'll just remove any excess fluid and distend the stomach with air. And I'm going to come back and look at the top of the stomach, which is actually the bottom of the sphincter. And what we see here is he has a small hiatal hernia. You can see as I move the scope in and out, you can see the tissue rolling up and into the esophagus and then back out. The scope is that black object coming out of about 11, 12 o'clock. And so this indicates that the ligaments that are supposed to hold the esophagus firmly under the diaphragm are loose. And so he has about a one centimeter to two centimeter hiatal hernia, which is not going to be a problem for us when we do his procedure. And we'll just document this area, and you'll be able to see the effect once we're done with the procedure. And then finally, we're going to go down and look at the bottom of his stomach, make sure we don't have any contraindications to doing a procedure now, such as gastric ulceration or cancer. And there really is no, nothing abnormal here. This is his pyloric sphincter muscle, which opens nicely. And we'll go through into the intestine. This is the duodenum, the first portion. And we'll move now into the second portion um, and down into the third portion. And, and this, his duodenum is normal here. So, 
So at this point, we need to place our guide wire, which is going to go down into the intestinal tract, into the duodenum, and we'll place that through the endoscope, and this will be the guide that we use. Thank you. So we'll place that nice and deep. And again, this just serves as a guide for the catheter. It's that's its only purpose. Remove any remaining fluid and we'll slowly push the endoscope out using the wire. The nurse will then grab that wire and stabilize it. There we go. And we'll remove the endoscope and move on to the actual strata procedure itself. As we have shown before, while we were measuring, the technician has gone ahead and put a red mark at the level of the Z-line, so this way for visual purposes, it's easy for me to document where we are, and it helps us measure the different positions. And she's also placed that number here on the screen. And we'll place that wire through the center of the instrument of the strata catheter. And we're gonna pass that then down into the patient to begin our treatments. Just going to use a very small amount of lubrication on the wire to facilitate passage as well as a small amount on the catheter. We don't want too much because we don't want it to get gummed up in the back of the patient's throat. Okay, and then we will pass the catheter down so that it is one centimeter above the actual measured Z-line, which is where we'll begin our first treatment. There are four levels of esophageal treatments. So since the Z-line is at 42, we'll begin at 41 centimeters. I want you to notice we're using a syringe with a blue valve that doesn't allow the balloon to distend the lumen or the wall of the esophagus preventing any risk of perforation and we put that into a count of about five to eight so it just barely touches the wall and then we extend the needles using this slider here and we'll look immediately at the monitor and we look at these outside numbers which are impedance numbers which tells us that we're in the muscle layer which is that what that's what we're trying to treat the lower the number, the more muscle we're treating. Uh, just simply step on a foot pedal, and that starts the radio frequency waves entering into the muscle. You'll notice that this, is, this is essentially has four arms here. Each of these arms represents an individual generator. So there are four needles, and each needle has its own generator, so that in the event that there's a malfunction of one particular needle, it'll just shut that one needle down. And what we see is beautiful impedances in the 100s. This is what we're looking for. And then this number in the middle is actually the temperature at the tip of the needle. And we want that between 65 and 85 degrees centigrade, roughly the temperature of a cup of tea or coffee. Why is that important? Well, that's important because as long as it stays within that range, it can't cause burning or destruction of the tissue. And so there's no scar tissue, but rather just a stimulating effect on the tissue itself. And that's really what the strata procedure does. It stimulates the muscle to grow. At the end of a one minute period of time, the machine will signal that it's done. We'll pull the needles back, remove any of the air from the balloon. And then I'm going to retract the catheter up to this first metal band. I do this to remove any uh -huh. fluid remaining in the esophagus. And then we're going to reintroduce this again, re-elongating the uh -huh. esophagus and re-establishing that length that we found endoscopically. We've rotated 45 degrees, and we'll slowly put the air back in, and the needles are back out again. Quickly, we look at the monitor, make sure that our needles are all functioning, and then begin the next treatment. With regard to the number of treatments in the esophagus, there are going to be four levels of treatment, and they're each a half a centimeter apart, and there are two treatments at each level. So a total of eight treatments, each eight a minute long, and it roughly takes about nine minutes to complete the esophageal phase of the treatment. Again, the importance of proper technique, removing the catheter, re-elongating the esophagus, moving to the next treatment level, which is now a half a centimeter above our Z-line, our junction between the stomach and the esophagus, and we begin the treatments again. When properly performed, these treatments are always placed in the exact perfect positions and we have maximal effect over time with these patients. Uh. Uh. Uh.
heard me talk about these two forms of reflux, one esophageal, one laryngeal, or known as LPR, or respiratory reflux. And, and I make these distinctions because they also, the recovery times are different. Usually by two months, people with standard reflux symptoms, in this particular gentleman's case, difficulty swallowing, regurgitation, heartburn, those types of symptoms are usually gone within two months. On the other hand, the laryngeal symptoms, such as throat clearing, hoarseness, mucus production, there we're really talking about having to wait perhaps closer to six months to see a more sustained response. Why is that? That is because the laryngeal type reflux is caused by a gaseous enzyme from the stomach known as pepsin, whereas in the esophagus we're talking about liquid, acid, or bile. And it's much easier to have the muscle to be strong enough to hold back a liquid than it is to hold back a gas. And that accounts really for the differences between the two types of reflux. So we are now halfway through the esophageal treatments and we're down at that Z line between the stomach the junction between the stomach and the esophagus. This is where the muscle in the sphincter becomes quite thick. And we start to see differences in the impedance readings of the needles. In fact, we should start to see much lower readings closer to the 90s and low 100s. Only because the muscle's thicker and so we're covering, uh, the, the needle is encased more and more of, of muscle. Each time when we remove the catheter, it's always important to remove the needles while the balloon is actually still inflated and pull them into the catheter. This avoids the problem of, of causing perforation of the balloon with the needle. And then we don't put the needles back out again until we have the balloon fully inflated. Other questions that were frequently asked by those who are considering undergoing a strata procedure, of course, involves what will I be able to do after the procedure? How will I be able to go back, for instance, to work or my daily activities? Uh, for the first day after the procedure, because the first day of the, during the day of the procedure, because you've been fairly heavily sedated, you will be tired and we really don't encourage you to go back to normal activity. And you can resume your normal diet almost immediately. The only thing we really ask is to avoid foods that are frequently not chewed very well enough. And those usually happen to be things with sharp edges like nuts and chips and pretzels. Other than that, almost any other soft food or type of food is, is able to be consumed immediately following the procedure. Now you've noticed throughout these esophageal treatments, and this is our last level, the first treatment of our last level, is again, I'm going to pull that catheter up each time so I can re-elongate the esophagus <coughs> and drain any fluid out of the esophagus. When we get down to the final two treatment levels, which will be in the stomach, I actually don't need to do that any longer because the treatments are on the stomach side rather than the esophagus, and you'll see that in just a moment. Again, as one of the safety features, you'll notice here that this particular generator side has grayed out. This needle was turned off because it failed to achieve proper therapeutic temperature. So since it was doing nothing, <clears throat> the unit turned the needle off. Again, another safety feature. You can lose uh, up to 25% of those generation points and still have a very effective procedure. During the procedure and while the uh, treatment is being administered, really there's very little um, work that the operator needs to do. Once the needles are properly placed, uh, I'm really just sustaining the catheter in this position. If I wanted to, I could actually drop the catheter and stand back and it would continue the treatment without my having to hold the catheter. <clears throat> because the balloon has stabilized the catheter in position and the needles are like fish hooks and they just curl into the tissue. So you can see here, we've gone through the first three treatment levels. These have grayed out. This is an indicator we've done the first level. We're about to gray out the fourth level, which now will tell me that we're done with our esophageal treatments. And things change at this point. We're gonna pull those needles back. I'm going to remove the air from the balloon. And again, this will be the last time I pull this catheter up. 
to the black to the uh, metal band and we're going to go down now into the stomach but we're going to go down two centimeters below the marking of the junction between the stomach and the esophagus and and what has happened here is the machine is now telling me that I need a specific volume of air in my balloon to do the next set of treatments and so it's asking me for 25 cc's of air I couldn't do that with this relief valve present so we're going to remove the relief valve put in that specific amount of air 25 cc's and we can safely put that in all at once because the balloon is down inside the stomach there's no danger of harming any structures and then with a very gentle pressure we're going to get that balloon to seat up into where the esophagus enters into the stomach and since there was a small hiatal hernia I'm expecting to be about two centimeters which is what I thought the hernia was above that Z line and that's exactly where it seats in the esophagus put my needles out and maintain a gentle back pressure and then we can start the treatment you'll notice when I say a gentle back pressure I'm using one finger worth of pressure here because I'm not trying to pull the catheter up into the esophagus I'm trying to just stabilize it in the stomach it's an important point to note that you should really only use one finger worth of pressure you know the amount of the amount of force you can generate by moving one finger is considerably smaller than if you're grabbing with a hand and using your wrist or pulling with your elbow or your shoulder <clears throat> so this maintains just the proper amount of pressure against the needles <clears throat> and maximizes therapy now in this particular case since we're working just in the stomach side not like in the esophagus I'm just going to pull the needles back and I just have to go in those two centimeters below the Z line rotate 30 degrees and then pull back again gently until I seat again up against the bottom of the stomach and then I'll put my needles out and maintain that pressure <clears throat> the type of anesthesia we use for this procedure is is known as moderate conscious sedation we want the patient to be maintained at a level where in case any fluid were to come into their throat they could sense it and either cough or swallow this avoids the complication of aspiration if the patient is too deeply asleep and fluid comes into the throat they will breathe that into their lungs and they will not be aware that they've done that and that can lead to aspiration pneumonia so the role of the anesthesia person is very very key to maintain that really perfect balance of awake and asleep and this is the third and final rotational treatment at this level at this point we've been working for approximately 12 minutes and we're just about done with only three additional treatments left we're going to pull the needles back and again insert the catheter down that two centimeter level but at this point we're going to shrink the size of the balloon down to 22 centimeters and the reason we do that is we want to be able to pull the balloon a little bit higher into that junction So I should be able to come up about another half a centimeter more, and that's exactly what you see here. And we'll extrude those needles and begin again. <clears throat> so we have three treatments at this level, and then we'll be finished. What exactly are we doing? What exactly is this procedure doing? We know one thing that it's not doing is, is, is it can't generate temperatures high enough to destroy tissue. So we're not causing scar tissue. We're not causing ulceration. We're really not causing any restriction to develop. What we know we are doing, because of animal studies that we've done, is we know that we are stimulating that muscle with low temperature and low energy. And, and when I talk about energy, we talk about watts. And so we're talking about five watts of energy. So think LED light bulb, right? You can't hurt anything with a five watt LED light bulb. And what that does is it stimulates the muscle to proliferate the number of muscle fiber bundles and also then increase the amount of muscle volume within each fiber bundle. So the muscle gets bigger, stronger, you know, think weightlifter on steroid kind of thing. And, and that's what gives you the additional pressure to hold back the reflux from the stomach. All right, so it's taken us approximately 16 minutes to complete this treatment. The needles are pulled back and the catheter is placed back in the stomach. And we're gonna drain the extra fluid that's in the stomach before we remove the catheter. And again, this is done to avoid complications such as aspiration. 
I'm going to go ahead and remove the air from the balloon. And we just have to withdraw the catheter at this point. At this point, we're going to go down and take a look at the effect of the procedure. Again, we're going to go up over the top of the tongue and head down towards the larynx. And as you can see, it's really intact. It hasn't changed at all. So this procedure, even though the catheter is moving in and out so many times, really has no effect on the larynx, no damage at all. So those of you who are concerned about your voice being affected, you may be singers, um, or speakers, it really doesn't affect it. It's normal to see a little bit of blebbing in the wall. This is caused by suction as we move the catheter. You may even see a little bit of blood left over from the procedure. And now we're back down at that junction area that used to be open. And I'm putting a lot of air in right now and it's just not opening any longer. So this is now swollen down again and is tight preventing any reflux from coming up. As I go through, I'll feel a little bit more resistance than I felt before. And we're gonna go down into the stomach and distend that with air, remove any excess fluid. And as you can see, there's no damage down in the bottom of the stomach either as a result of the procedure. And we'll come up and we should see a nice rim of thickened tissue and if you compare this image here with the image that we'll show you now on the side of the screen from the original time we were down, you will see that this area is now closed off where before there was a small hernia and things were open, things were gapped open, allowing reflux. So there's no reflux taking place here any longer with this now tight around the scope. And notice as I move the scope in and out, the tissue moves with the scope as opposed to rolling uh, in, in front of it. And that's the end of the procedure. We'll remove any remaining air and secretions. And he'll go out to recovery now and it'll take him roughly 45 minutes to an hour to recover.